Thank you so much for um, agreeing to talk with me. Um, of yeah. Um, so this is everyone listening. This is Trish Harnito, um, who directed the short film You Wouldn't Understand um, and did a lot of other things for it. Um, so uh, first off, uh, can you just kind of explain the production timeline of the film to me? Uh, you know, when did you first get the idea and how long did it take from production to distribution? Sure. Um, gosh, I think that um, Jacob and I uh, had come up with the idea maybe about three months before we shot it. And we shot it like late 2019. And so we had kind of like roughed it out and talked about it, wrote a script, and then um, went and sat and had a drink with our buddy, Anthony Arkin, who, you know, is one of our collaborators, and kind of talked through just the script and our visions for it and kind of went away and rewrote from there. And then we just started working, you know, on the production aspect of it, looking for a location and, you know, trying to figure out how we were going to do certain things. I mean... Tony and our DP, John uh, Gebhardt and myself, like had an instrumental coffee meeting trying to figure out how to make, this is giving something away, but some, someone falls from the sky halfway through. Uh, and um, that, and that, was, that was a pretty fun meeting we had there. Um, but I think that all in all, it was about three months from writing it through shooting it. And then, um, and then another you know, many, many months in post as we kind of put it together. And, uh, and we actually, it premiered at Fantasia Film Festival uh, in Canada this past September. And so it's kind of hit some festivals this fall and we are obviously just thrilled that it's kind of not ending its run, but having this big moment at Sundance too. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, you kind of already talked about revisions, but you know, were there any huge script changes from beginning to end or did you kind of know what you were doing from the get go? Oh, I mean, we, we knew what we were doing. And um, I think like, as far as like script changes go, I think we made certain adjustments. I, I would actually say we had script discoveries <laughs> instead of changes, <laughs> uh, kind of when we got, when we got, you know, to location and stuff, we we, we found some fun things to, to add in that had not been the vision before. And I think that's like, that's one of the things that all, Anthony and Jacob and I really love too, is that, you know, we, we want to learn from our location and like, you know, keep making the film better. So it wasn't about, you know, going in with like, like a rigorous set script and sticking to it. It was also about, you know, letting the environment speak to us and, you know, see how we could use it. Mm hmm What's the, uh, what's the digital festival circuit been like? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's been great that, you know, that, that people have continued to, you know, watch films and there's been a home for places to go. But, you know, I was just talking to a friend of mine the other day. We haven't seen this in the theater or I've never sat yeah. with an audience. And so one of the really funny things is that we, like we've never heard, you know, we've never heard a, like a live response. So, so it's been just kind of, you know, talking to people like yourself who've seen it or, you know, getting notes or reading reviews or whatnot, but never has there been just kind of that like beautiful moment of understanding how the live audience is reacting to the film. So hopefully, you know, that day will come hopefully soon. Uh, we all would love to see it that way. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I was definitely chuckling throughout. So it it does make me feel. Better. <laughs> I mean, I wish I wish there was a way to under you know to to kind of get that audience feedback that I think that are so great with festivals too, mm -hmm. especially like, you know, some of the genre festivals where it played that have like legendary fans that go to these and are so into everything and so that was a, that was um. A, I just dropped my glasses. Oh, that's okay. Disappointing, but, um, but, you know, on the flip side, more people probably are going to be able to see the film. So mm -hmm. that's good. Um, so your MFA is in playwriting uh, mm -hmm. and you've written, you know, several plays, but what uh, made you branch out into screenwriting and you also have a book? Um, and then how do you kind of adjust to the different mediums? Well, I think, you know, I've, I've always been interested in film and I think that like, you know, educationally in my background was always in theater and, you know, and I still consider myself, you know, a playwright. Um, but when I met Jacob, 
we, you know, he had done a lot of comedy and a lot of, you know, short form comedy. And, um, and I, I, you know, definitely I am a dark comedy person. That's kind of my background as well. And so, so we just kind of started talking about doing something together and he had met Tony, Anthony Arkin, and, and the three of us started talking about a film and we made our first film together, I think in 2012, actually. And, um, and so it was really like, you know, kind of by the inch, I would say, like the learning curve very high because it's a much more technical, you know, art form as, as you know. Uh, and, and, and just slowly over the years, we made a ton of short comedies and we really made them for ourselves and we would send them out to festivals and stuff. But, but, but we, like the three of us discovered, you know, and we, we basically produce our work under Steel Drum and Space, that's our company. And um, that we just, we like to make each other laugh and we, we like to like, like hone in on a crazy tone and really, you know, find kind of a strange balance. Um, through our filmmaking together and um and it's just kind of gone from there and so it's been it's been really wonderful to you know find those two guys and like have us just you know keep getting better as we go to mm-hmm. um do you have a i mean out of all of those mediums sorry i don't know if you can hear that that's no um, is it me no it's it's my it's my phone apologies okay. no um but uh, anyway, out of all those different mediums, do you have one that is, you know, like a personal favorite of yours or, um, sorry, it keeps, stop it. Okay. Um, do you have one that's a personal favorite? Honestly, they're all so different. And, mm-hmm. and um, I, I mean, I have the longest relationship with theater. And so, you know, just based on that, I would say, you know, theater's great, but the control that you can have sometimes in film and how you can really sculpt a moment is really, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, but I'm also, I'm working on a, a narrative podcast series right now. And, oh, yes, um, I saw that on your and, website. And that's been a completely, you know, obviously it was, you know, kind of due to our COVID pivot with mm-hmm. everything. But it's also, you know, just sound and, and, and working in the audio space and, and really kind of understanding what that is has also been like, a really exciting time to even take, you know, go, you know, learn how to use another medium to the full extent. I mean, it's just been great. Um, speaking of creative control, um, you were, I mean, you know, so many hats during this production. Uh, did any of them, you know, contradict each other? Like the writer director wanted to do more, but the producer realized that it wouldn't be feasible? Or was it more of a complementary relationship since you did, since it afforded you more creative control over the, over the project? Yeah, I think um, I, the latter, I, more of a complementary thing. I mean, obviously, anything that I, Jacob and I wrote in the script, I knew that we would have to produce as well. Mm-hmm. And so that, that, that kind of keeps you in check a little bit. Uh, since that was how we were going to do this one project. But I don't think, I don't, and I don't say that in a way to mean it was stifling at all, because it's not. And I, and I definitely think that um, we don't shy away from writing in challenges and then figuring out, you know, a way to do them uh, that, that we can, you know, do within a budget. Um, so no, I mean, I, especially in these short forms, being a producer on it as well, actually, I think is a really great part of the process because, you you're not you're not answering to somebody else that holds the purse strings uh for one and and it also i think that like those kind of constraints can actually make you more creative Mm -hmm. definitely um one thing speaking of creativity but one thing that i really loved about the film is that it was it was playing with these you know really big uh i'd sci-fi ideas of you know time travel time loops and you know predestination and all that but it was um there was such a fun level of kind of absurdity to it and it was still Mm. on a really small scale um so how did you kind of balance like going for these big concepts but still keeping it really small and personal i think i could that's one of the things that like i'm very interested in and um i think collectively with steel drum and space too is 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 how do you take something that looks very recognizable and almost mundane and twist it so it shows a different side of of ordinary, I guess. And so that, you know, that sort of tone and uh, is, I feel like I do it in my plays. I, I do it in my podcast. It's something that I, that to me is endlessly fascinating. And, you know, with you, what I understand, um, I, 
I think that we really set out to make an enjoyable film that was constantly surprising. And we wanted it to be this kind of strange journey where you think that you're watching one thing, but then it's like, wait, what, what is this? And then it kind of, you know, genre busts and keeps evolving and, you know, lends itself hopefully for people wanting to watch it again, you know, with the knowledge that they have at the end of the movie, then to go back. And so I'm, so that all of those things are, are absolutely kind of why I do anything actually is to kind of explore that and, and, and kind of the absurdity that you talk about is, is very much my plays as well. And, um, and I just always find it very fascinating that people think naturalism is, uh, you know, people speaking in full sentences about, you know, dinner or whatnot. And I just don't think that's naturalism. To me, it's what you saw in at least the first half of the, our film. You know, everything's very weird. People are very skeptical of each other. <laughs> like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and when you start to listen to how people talk, I, 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 I just, I think quite often, you know, um, it's absurd, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah well I uh, I really I really enjoyed that part of the film. Um, so uh, the music also was another aspect of the film that I really enjoyed. So what was you know how did you find the composer and what was that process like? Yeah. So um, Eleanor Oppenheim. We um, I did not know her and I still have never met her. Um, really. Mm -hmm. I wow. uh, we worked together you know over email and stuff, mm -hmm. but I had um. I'd reached out to a composer, a friend of mine, Missy Mazzoli, who is wonderful, wonderful composer. And I had asked her just if she, I knew, I knew that we wanted to work with a female composer. And I had asked her if she had any, you know, knew of any, you know, young female composers that she would recommend. Um, and I was looking to, to do part of the score for this film. And I kind of knew, you know, we, we definitely knew what we wanted it to feel like, you know, and so, I had like described it in very non-musical terms, what, what that, what that score should be. Um, and then Eleanor was just wonderful and, um, and she was game and she came on board and her music is the section um, in this, in the middle of the film from like the long, the, like the long approach by mm -hmm. the angelic, mm -hmm. by Jacob. Um, and so that is her score that kind of, beautifully balanced this sort of like slow horror and like strange questioning of what is going on um but yeah it was great um okay so fun question um what's your favorite time travel movie or tv show or just piece of media yeah um it's a very good question um <laughs> all of them is my first response but i would I, i'd say like you know i really enjoyed like doctor who yeah and, you know, <laughs> Going, I, oh my God, I just watched Back to the Future again, like mm -hmm. over the holidays. It was so fun. But I will trace my obsession with kind of time travel um, to reading A Wrinkle in Time as a kid. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. That book. And it's just not, not even the movie version, you know what I mean? But like the book and this concept of how time travel could work. I, for what, whatever reason, I mean, I, I, obviously I'm not alone in this, but uh, it, it, it just clicked and it might've been like, I was at the perfect age, you know, to read it. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I understand time travel. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it became so accessible and that seems so easy. Um, so I really, really, really kind of like draw it all back to a wrinkle in time. Yeah. I, I love that book when I was yeah. younger and I mean, Doctor Who, I've watched almost all of it. So <laughs> I can totally relate to that. Um, and then going back to theater, what's a mm -hmm. theater piece that you wish more people saw or knew about or talked about? You know, it's funny. I, um, so the podcast that I mentioned that I'm creating, so it's a six part narrative series and in it, it's about the cruise ship uh, industry. Mm. It's called, it's called the MS Phoenix rising. And, um, in it, it's like the front office of a cruise ship. Uh, who's rebranding and relaunching after a hiatus that is not ever gone into. Um, mm -hmm. And they bring, part of the relaunch is that uh, they bring, or they want, they want to bring over a piece of experimental theater. Uh, instead of doing like a big musical on board, they want to do uh, Eugene Ionesco's The Chairs, awesome. which is a one act that um, I recommend everybody read. I have always been obsessed with The Chairs and, um, 
And so it's been kind of fun because I've got to kind of like, you know, go into it a little bit within, within the, you know, within this podcast. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I would say the chairs is, is, is a really wonderful, crazy, absurd piece of writing that anyone could draw, you know, parallels or inspiration from today. Awesome. Yeah. I'm always, always on the lookout for some new theater. Oh, it's wild. You should read it. Awesome. I, I will. Um, yeah. Well, those are all my questions, but I just want to say again, um, how much I appreciated you taking the time to talk with me and how much, I mean, I really, I really did enjoy this film so much. Oh, I had so much fun watching it. Good. Um, are you a filmmaker yourself? Well, I'm still in school. So yeah. um, I'm hoping to go more into pre-production or development side of film. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was, it was so much fun uh, to watch and I'm really glad that I got this opportunity. Um, so thank you so much. No, thank you. And um, have fun at Sundance. Thank you.